Good morning, everyone, wherever you may be in the world, and welcome to Jewish Notions of the Holy featuring Professor Moshe Halbertal. We're very delighted to have you here. Um, I'm Shana Hammerman. I am the Associate Director of Jewish Studies at the Taube Center for Jewish Studies, and I would like to briefly invite any of you who are interested in Jewish Studies events and uh, what we're offering this quarter and beyond to send me your email address in the chat and I will send you all of the amazing calendar events coming up. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce Professor Charlotta von Robert who will take it from here. Please uh, enjoy yourselves. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> good morning uh, in California and good evening or Erev Tov to Israel. <laughs> Um, I'm uh, Charlotte von Robert, the director of the Taube Center for, um, uh, for Jewish Studies, uh, and I welcome everyone into this Stanford Zoom space. Um, and I want to start with thanking my colleague and friend, uh, Professor Amir Eschel, who is the Edward Clark Crosset Professor of Humanistic Studies and Professor of German and Comparative Literature for initiating this Zoom visit and conversation. Uh, Professor Eschel teaches a seminar on notions of the holy uh, this quarter, and um, he suggested to uh, bring back Professor Moshe Halbertal to Stanford, uh, in part because Professor Halbertal had I cannot say Professor Halbertal, Moishe <laughs> had uh, written uh, a reflection on the notion of Kedusha. Uh, so we are looking forward uh, to learn uh, from and with him. So it is my great honor and pleasure to welcome back to our Stanford community, Professor Moishe Halbertal and to many and most of us, he does not need an, an introduction at all since he has been and is a teacher for many of us. He was my teacher um, many years ago and continues to be my teacher, um, either in person or through his writing and both. Uh, he's one of the most beloved, I will say most beloved and admired teachers in Israel at Hebrew University and at the public interface of the Hartman Institute. And he's also the uh, Gruss Professor of Law at New York University. Uh, so he bridges both academic worlds. Um, I'll just say a few things because uh, you all came to hear from um, Professor Habertal. Um, he's, one, uh, he's also one of the most, um, one of the most eminent scholars of Jewish intellectual history and uh, Jewish public intellectuals who is deeply grounded in the three millennia of Jewish thinking and faith commitments. Not only that, he's one of the most prolific writers with many books to his name, each of them tackling the universe of Jewish thought and philosophy from different angles. Uh, so on the one hand, on concepts um, and uh, terms that are central to, to Jewish thinking. So I'll just name a few and each of them has what I want to say are most readable books, uh, not just in, um, in, in technical academic terms. Uh, the first one on idolatry in 1992 and then uh, moving through various uh, conceptual basically conceptual worlds, uh, one on inter interpretation, interpretive revolutions in the making, a book on canon, the people of the book, a book on revelation, concealment and revelation in 2001, and on sacrifice um, in 2012, and most recently also on doubt, the birth of doubt. Um, as I said, they're all eminently readable. Um, and the other area um, that he writes about is the great medieval thinkers and halachists. Um, uh, first of all, the Meiri, Menachem HaMeiri, one of the, some of us think about him as one of the liberal, so to speak, uh, Talmudic commentators. Um, and um, in 2014, a beautiful book on the Rambam, on Maimonides, His Life and Thought. 
Um, and most recently, last year, came out the book on the Ramban. And hopefully, we will bring you back in person to Stanford campus uh, to teach the book. And most of uh, the books um, are uh, appear also in English, so in Hebrew and English. Again, really making an effort to uh, bro uh, to bridge both uh, Jewish thought worlds. At the moment, uh, the U.S. and um, Israel. Um, and I also want to say that um, these books are not merely historical studies, but studies that unlock each of these gedolei hagedolim be Yisrael or of these great thinkers in Israel, uh, and therefore bring them into the 21st century of Jewish thinking. Um, and in a way, in each case, Moshe becomes them and makes them his own. Um, and last but not least, certainly, um, as uh, um, Professor Habata was also my teacher, he, he incorporates more than most people that I know the value of Shafal Ruach, which is one of the humility of spirit, which is one of the, the values that the Rambam really uh, praised. And so, um, which makes uh, Moshe Habatal a beloved teacher in Israel. So um, therefore, I hope everyone can help me, except we can show that with welcoming you to Israel, uh, to Stanford. <laughs> and I'm so happy and pleased that to learn from you again. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Charlotte, for the uh, warm introduction. Really, it's it's so, so welcoming and, and wonderful. And Amir, uh, thank you for for bringing us together, and Ariel and China for for joining us and helping this thing, and for everyone who has joined this discussion. So really, it's it's a pleasure, and I wish uh, very soon we're gonna be uh, be um, be able to confirm our being in a non-virtual way, uh, in 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 sitting together. So, uh, so really, really thank you. And uh, the the topic that we want to address is the the concept of gdusha, holiness, or sac the sacred, and the distinction between uh, the holy and the profane, between kodesh and chol, is we would say the essential religious distinction. If the ethical is the distinction between good and bad, or good and evil if the aesthetic is the distinction between the ugly and the beautiful, if the political is the distinction between enemy and ally in a certain way, um, the religious distinction is the distinction between the sacred and the profane. In some ways, it's more primary than any theological concept of God and other things. It's the ultimate religious distinction. And therefore, whatever we would say about that, the meaning of the, the idea of the holy, the notion of the Kedusha, Kadosh, will be a, a partial, just a, an angle, uh, because such a basic concept, nourishing so much of the religious life and tradition, will take different meanings and permutations in, in, in sometimes even in the same tradition. And what why I, I want to, um, to do is uh, to take a particular angle based on a phenomenological understanding of halacha, of the function of the term kadosh in Jewish law, halacha, and uh, work from that um, maybe some, some largely existential political insights that stem from this understanding of the sacred. Now, uh, at the background, there is the work that was very, very influential in religious phenomenology of, of Gdusha, the work by Rudolf Otto, the idea of the holy, that uh, interpreted the concept of the holy experientially, meaning, uh, uh, Holiness is, is, um, is, a, is a realm of encounter, of, 
of a human encountering the holy. And it's, uh, it's, um, it's exclusively defined through a certain feature of experience that is unique, which is the tremendum, the kind of awe, dread, and yet attraction. It's a kind of a combination between um, awe, dread, and attraction, which is not reducible to any other experiences. It's a kind of sui generis as such. And uh, I remember, I remember the great impact that reading Otto uh, left on me. And this is a kind of a pro it's a it's a, a certain Protestant variation of of the notion of a holy. And then I began to ask myself, well, can I apply to to ways in which the Jewish tradition uh, uses the, the the adjective? And you know, I recall that there is there is concept in the Mishnah Shvi'it uh, called Gdushat Perot the, Shvi'it. The 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 fruits of the sabbatical here are sacred. And I remember, I don't know, gazing at the, at the grapes of the sabbatical year, and I didn't experience neither tremendum, nor the numinos, et cetera. I said, what's going on here? How, how do I interpret that? So I, I then began a, a, a kind of trying to figure out the way the adjective is used in Jewish tradition, holy. Well, it applies to time, clearly, Mikra'i Kodesh, sacred time. And I'm gonna talk about that. It applies to space, land, temple mount, degrees of, of holiness in space, the Kdushat Batei Knesset, the, the sacredness of a synagogue. It applies to objects like fruits, like, animals that are that are consecrated uh, a whole variety of objects that have dusha it applies to language by the way lashona kodesh hebrew lashona kodesh it also applies to persons but i just want to say one thing the adjective kadosh in the jewish tradition is very rare very rare by the way i i tried once to uh, I try to count the people who are called Kdoshim, saints, etc. I hardly reach a minion. I hardly reach 10 people in the Jewish tradition. I mean, maybe we can reach a minion. You know, you say Rabbeinu Kadosh about Rabbi Udanasi. You say Ari Kadosh clearly. Or Chaim Kadosh we used to say about Chaim Ben Atar. You know, you say Ayudi Kadosh Mipshischa, uh, uh, the father of uh, of Rabbi Yudah Hasid Shmuel was called the Hasid Kadosh, but it's very rare. Uh, that's the difference maybe between Christianity and Judaism is the we have an inflation of geonim, of uh, of geniuses, but we uh, but but very 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 uh, strict about the adjective kadosh is very rare. Rashi Kadosh they used to say sometimes. Etc. And and it's interesting to to think about it. So there is a whole realm of uh, of use of the term kdusha. And I want to begin with time. How is time defined as kadosh? And by the way, uh, Mircea Eliade had a lot of uh, uh, interest in sacredness of time in terms of cyclical original time that you come back to and other things, when you look at the term Kadosh, Zman Kadosh, Mikrai Kodesh, days where you say Kiddush, you sanctify the day or you declare the holiness of the day, they have one basic halachic function, which is work is prohibited. There's always a relationship between Kedushat Zman and prohibition on Melacha, on work. For example, let's take a day which is festive and it's Chag Purim or Chanukah. 
they're not sacred times. For we are not going to say a Kiddush before Purim. Chol HaMoed, Chol HaMoed, uh, is, uh, you know, it's a Moed, it's a, it's a particular time, but it's Chol, it's Chulin, Kodesh Vechol. And one thing that distinguishes between Shabbat, the first day of Passover, Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, etc., etc., that are called Mikra'i Kodesh, is that a prohibition of work. That's, you know that the time is sacred when you're not allowed to do melacha in it. That's, I mean, functionally, that's a very important point. It's biblical and also non-biblical. That's the case. Now, when we, uh, um, and I want to say one thing about that uh, uh, soon, but I want to come to the notion of sacred space. And when the Mishnah describes sacred space, and it says, it talks about the Kedushat Batei Knesset, it says, you're not allowed to make a shortcut through a synagogue. Uh, so he, the synagogue has two doors, north and south. You cannot cross through the synagogue from north to south or from west to east, etc., etc., to make a shortcut. The space is sacred. And what it means both in terms of time and space, and here's my, my take on the concept of the sacred, it means that you give up control and sovereignty over a certain element of your encounter with the world. It, me it means that you cannot manipulate the space for your own uses. Uh, and that's the meaning you're not allowed to make a shortcut out of it. And, uh, and uh, what is work? By the way, work is not an effort. We all know that in Shabbat, you can carry a big cupboard on your shoulders from one corner of your room back and forth all of Shabbat. You didn't perform work. Work is uh, the definition of melacha in Shabbat means transforming the world in such a way that you open, you transform an object to a new use, to a new human use through effort, through work. And uh, it is a form of owning the world. Right? Work, melacha is a form. So you express the world is created by avoiding as a gift, as something which is not fully you, by avoiding manipulating it and transforming it, leaving it as it is in a deep way. And that's the sacredness of it. So sacredness, to say that something is kadosh is to say that you cannot instrumentalize it. It's, I would say kdusha is the realm of the non-instrumental. And, and uh, any time, now there clearly are gradations of Gdusha. There are gradations of Gdusha. There are levels of Gdusha. So if we take, by the way, let's come back to that fruit that I've never encountered the numinous confronting it, right? The sabbatical fruit, the orange, the whatever. And one thing is very important. You can consume it. You can eat fruits of Shnat Shvit. But you are not, you're not allowed to process it. You're not allowed to sell it. You're not allowed to process it. You're not allowed to make it something else. You're allowed to consume it as it is, which means you're not allowed to transform it. And, uh, and, that's, the, uh, and that's, the essence, that's the essence of the distinction between Kodesh and Chol. Chol, the profane, the realm of the secular, is the unmediated realm, meaning the realm in which you can use freely, which you fully own. You fully own. The sacred is not something you fully own, thus you cannot instrumentalize. 
and uh, uh, and that's the the demarcating line between the sacred and the profane in the language of halacha. By the way, I just want to come back to the issue of Lashon Kodesh of uh, of um, the the Hebrew as Lashon Kodesh, and uh, we know we know that that the ultimate human tool is language, right? the ultimate human tool. And the resistance, by the way, the resistance, there was a, a whole tradition of Jewish bilingualism through Ladino, Yiddish, Arabic, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, where somehow there was a resistance to the full use of Hebrew as a, as, a, as a language for everything, right? And part of the tensions around the revival of the language, Hebrew language is around the, the, the kind of almost uh, desecration of the sacred. So what is desecration? What is chilula kodesh? What is meila kodesh? Meila kodesh is taking control, instrumentalizing the uninstrumental. Clearly, something becomes uninstrumental because it, it stands in a particular relationship to God. But the way it is, uh, uh, the way in, in that respect, and here maybe another angle on the topic, in that respect, we know that a Kodesh Baruch Hu, not a Kadosh Baruch Hu, a Kodesh Baruch Hu in, in the earlier versions of the name, God is a Kodesh. Part of, part of the concept of transcendence or our sense of transcendence comes from uh, non-instrumentalizing. The idea that it's beyond your reach, beyond your capacity to manipulate. It will be all mediated by limits. And the higher the Kedusha is, the greater the constraints on ownership and instrumentalizing. If, by the way, I just want to say one thing. I'm interested in, if we want to extend it to, uh, to the secular domain, and you ask yourself clearly, such rich concepts, such rich concepts, have always resonance beyond their theological religious practices, right? They they, they echo in the whole realm of human experience, which is not tied to that particular religious tradition. And I always ask myself, what's the sacred in the world of, of the secular in some ways? Yes? I look at TV, yeah? ask myself, I wanna look at this society, what's sacred in that society? So here's a definition, a possible definition of what is, what is a sacred in a certain society? Does it have a concept of the sacred? Is there anything sacred? So you look at TV programs, and I'll give you now a, a way of, of identifying the sacred. Those two TV programs that have high rating of, of, uh, of audience that are not going to be interrupted by advertisements, you know you have touched the societal concept of the sacred. By the way, in Israel, it's very interesting in TV that is clearly not marked or not bounded by traditional concepts. Uh, for example, the, the, we are now in the eve of Yom HaShoah, uh, of the Holocaust Memorial Day. Nobody will dare in the broadcast of the, of the, of the ceremony of Yom HaShoah and Yad Vashem will dare interrupt it for advertisement for, I don't know, for a bank or or beer, beer is, a, is an American kind of advertisement all, the, all over the place, whatever. Nobody will dare, it will, it, will, it will be experienced as violation of the sacred. And, uh, and by the way, when I, I think, and here, here, here I will come a little closer to politics and maybe we can say something more about it in that conversation. I, I wanna say one thing about when you look at, at politics and you say uh, leaders that we respect and other things, we say, well, part of the problem of politics, the politics, the realm of ultimate instrumentalization, right? It's susceptible, politics, power is susceptible to two reversals. So uh, let's say for us, the subjects, the citizens, Power are means for something, for a goal. 
sometimes, not all the time, for those in power, power is the end, right? What is the main goal of a president in the in the first uh, in his first time in presidency, right? It's to win the the second time, right? Or possible. Uh, and not only that, in politics, we are we used to see instrumentalization of goals for maintaining power. Now, part of the loss of trust and break of trust in politics is when you we don't realize that somehow there, there is a sense of the sacred. By that, I mean the following, that there are some decisions that are not governed by power calculations, right? You don't sell, you hope, right? You hope. You don't sell, sol send soldiers to war because it gives you a better chance to win an election. Right? There is some realm that is not instrumentalized, that transcends you. I mean, by way of asking, what I did till now, I, I, I did two things. First of all, I tried to, again, it's really a partial view of such a rich basic concept. I tried to give a phenomenology of the Kodesh Chol distinction, the sacred profane distinction within uh, Jewish, mainly halacha of time, space, and other aspects. Second, and I, my sense always of, of the depth of basic concepts is that if they're powerful, humanly, they carry beyond them, right? They carry, they, they have echoes in the way, let's say, the concept of idolatry will play a major role uh, in, in the history of human thought through Marx's concept of the fetish, through Freud's concept of the fetish, etc., etc. It's a rich concept. Even if you peel the larger theological, metaphysical envelope of it, the same with the same. So I tried as well to, uh, to extend the, 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 to explicate what I would call the extensions of the primary religious distinction into realms beyond the religious life in a narrow sense, and how what they call they capture, I would say, a sense of transcendence. I want to end with a comment in the place where I am now, Jerusalem, the holy Ira Kodesh, Ira Kodesh, right? Here is a Ira Kodesh, the holy city, the holy land. Now, uh, Jerusalem, by the way, is not only Ira Kodesh, it's Ira Kodesh for many religions, and it's the, I would say, the overlapping maps of the sacred. Uh, you go in, not far away from where I live, the, you know, the old cities, the overlapping maps of the sacred. And, uh, and you have in the political, what I would call the political abuse of the concept of the sacred, you have the following formula that you hear all the time. Maybe we can extend on that in the discussion. If it's sacred to me, it's mine, right? Which is actually a violation of the concept of the sacred. Because if it is sacred to you, it couldn't be yours, right? By the way, those who are very careful about the sacredness of the Temple Mount slash Haram el Sharif, I mean, I, being an observant person, never stepped in, in a certain area in, in Harabai because it's sacred, you don't step there. Which means you cannot claim it's yours what you cannot step there, right? But the whole idea of the notion of the sacredness is, uh, is uh, limits on sovereignty claims. And again, Eretz HaKodesh, the holy land, uh, means as well that you, the ownership is always conditional, that, that there is an inherent possibility of exile in living in the sacred, in Eretz HaKodesh as such. So these are just, uh, just some, some possible, I would say, uh, political theological uh, 
uh, implications, but I was trying to do mainly two things. Is first to explicate my my the way I I, I I understand a certain aspect of the Jewish understanding of the sacred profane distinction in distinction from Rudolf Otto, Eliade and others, and the way they can be extended towards a larger conception of the transcendent, the connection between the sacred and the transcendent, and with some initial thoughts about the larger politi uh, political theological ramifications of the concept. So I, I, uh, I stop here my initial presentation and remarks. Wonderful, Moshe, thank you so much. Um, perhaps since you and I had a chance to speak recently, um, I would like Charlotte and Ariel to begin and then I'll chime in um, with your permission. So Charlotte, Ariel, maybe you start and then I will follow later. I can start, thank you. Um... Um, Moesha, thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, I, uh, this is, uh, I mean, wonderfully presented and structured. And I just have, uh, I mean, I guess I have a question to open this up with, uh, with which is, um, I mean, I'm very attracted to the, right, to the approach of thinking, uh, of thinking, um, about the holy in terms of uh, you cannot commodify it, you cannot um, instrumentalize it in these various dimensions. But I wonder, and this sort of, this is where the, you angled in, in, the, in the end, I wonder whether, um, whether there's a way to also positively define it, not just in these uh, right uh, negative terms, so to speak. In um, this is what the holy, what you cannot do with the holy, right? Um, but since, and I'm thinking of, I mean, I can see how you can make it work. But I'm thinking, let's say, in the Mishnah, uh, right, Mishnah Kelim on the degrees, the ten degrees of holiness, whether mm -hmm. there. In the end, you do have a, a right. You have an essential, more essential notion of the holy, right? Within, right? Within the thought world of the Mishnah, so to speak. To uh, uh, so it's not just the right bound by the prohibition of, in, 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 right, in the prohibition of work and prohibition of abusing it. But here's a way, an attempt to sort of articulating something. Um, in a m more, I, I, I don't know, for lack of a better term, in a more, right, the, the land is holy, the city is holy, and then we end up uh, in, the, in the holy of holies, um, right? So that, that was one, uh, one thought about this, and then, right, then where would that go, um, right? Where, uh, where, would, where would you go with this? And then the other thought I was having, um, this is uh, right in, in terms of the structure of the Mishnah, purity is another one, right? That it would be another sort of, uh, certainly for the Mishnah, I don't know whether, right, how you want to categorize it, but another religious category in, in that sense, sure. right? It doesn't fit in that. In, in, in either of the ethical and the aesthetic, obviously. So, so there, um, right, th that value of, of uh, uh, Tahara, again, right, uh, um, it, it also fits beautifully with the way you think about Kedusha, that is also mostly defined through not being Tameh, rather than being, right, taking the other approach. But so that, uh, that to right. me is also an interesting, right, the, the, the particularly halachic sort of, right, thinking about purity as a, as a, um, as a, um, uh, religious kind of, kind of category. Right. right. So, so thanks. These are these are wonderful questions. So, uh, I I want to address uh, the first question uh, about the what what you 
rightfully uh, seeking for a positive context. context. So, and here I will make a relationship between the sacred and love. But why is it that we are attracted to the sacred? Because love is an uninstrumental relation, right? Uh, and the attractiveness of a realm in which we engage non-instrumentally, either with time, space, and with one another, is, a, is that precious uh, a mode, right? In which we are, I would say, freed from the cage or from the grip of instrumentalizing. So uh, if I want to give an analogy, uh, if you are very, very wealthy, or some very wealthy people, when they enter a museum and you ask yourself, well, how can I get that painting to my living room? It's not clear that you can actually enjoy the painting. I mean, it's, it's kind of, a, you don't see that painting in a way, right? Uh, so it opens up a whole field of relationship religiously and humanly in the way that sacred times enable through its, uh, you know, experiencing the world as a gift, as not yours, right? That opens up for a whole set of, of human potentials that have a positive content, that express our yearning for the sacred. So that's one aspect of, of what we will call, uh, and this is why, uh, this is why uh, it's, it's called the gift, right? Shabbat is a gift, you know, the, the gift of the sacred, the gift of, uh, the, gift of the sacred, the, the sense of being, being bestowed by, by the gift of a realm of a realm that frees us, that allows us to encounter transcendence in the world and in us and in others and other things. So that's, I would say, a, a very important addition that grows from your direction. The other thing is what's the relationship between Kodesh Chol Taratuma, which is really subtle and uh, and it, clearly there is an overlap, which is complex. But one distinction is that the whole is not particularly tame, right? Tame, uh, tame is much more threatening and dangerously, uh, dangerously endowed than something which is chulin. Uh, so, um, so here. Um, and therefore, the category of Tameh is a category of removal and separation, which is not the case of the category of the whole. I just want to say one very interesting, and we, we know this Mishnah, and that's where actually the distinction applies. Uh, because when the rabbis, here is another adjective for sacred books, right? Kitve HaKodesh. Kitve HaKodesh, the sacred writings. And the, the way the Mishnah defines always Kitve HaKodesh, they say metami metayadayim, right? Kitve HaKodesh, def, defile those who touch them. And the, and, and the Mishnah quotes the Tzdokim, who says, Kovlim anachnu alechem prushim, שאתם אומרים כתבי הקודש מתמים את הידיים וכתבי מרס, הומרוס, אינם מתמים את הידיים. How could it be that the sacred defiles, etc., etc.? And then, and then uh, the Prushim answer, if, if I remember the quote by heart, I, they said to them, קובלים אנחנו עליכם צדוקים שאתם אומרים עצמות כהן גדול, יוחנן כהן גדול, Metamim, right? The 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 uh, etc. Ela kedei shelo yase adam atzmot avi v'imot arvadim. So mipnei mipnei chibatam itumatam. I I'm going to explain that, which is the following. Uh, since why is it why here's an interesting rabbinic concept. Why does the dead 
why is in order to, the dead is the source of defilement and uh, and we know that a human dead is uh, defiles much more than a, an animal a corpse of an animal and the and the rabbinic idea is that defilement is a way of preserving the sacredness of the dead right because by claiming that any contact with it defiles you were not going to allow the horrible abuse of, of bones of making them instruments as if they're resources, etc. etc. The same thing with scripture, Kitvea Kodesh Metamim means if you touch them, you have to go through a purifying process, which means that you're not going to touch them every moment, right? They're not going to be easily accessible. So I, I want to say one thing. I mean, this is just a side comment. I, I, I want to say one thing that there is an, a very interesting overlap, and yet there is a very potent distinction, which is that unlike the secular, the tame, the 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 the, uh, the, the, the tame has a element of danger, right? Tuma, defilement that the secular doesn't have. Therefore it can attach itself to the holy in a, in a very complicated, complex way, which is expressed in that set of Mishnayot in Traktat Yadayim. But that's just a, a very partial uh, response to a, a very deep question. What is the relationship between these categories? So thanks. Thank you, Moshe Ariel. Thank you, Moshe. As always, this was stunningly erudite and strikingly clear. Thank you. Um, I wanted to think together, and maybe you can help me help shed some light on this, about how, how we might go about considering, on the one hand, holiness as the abandonment of sovereignty, a kind of emphasis of transcendence, the gift-oriented nature of understanding of Kedusha, which I think is really wonderful, with the ability of human beings to make things holy, sure. to, to designate that status, to be makdish something. Sure. Um, and I mean that both in the classical rabbinic sense of it. And then I'm also thinking, you know, I work on a chassidut and, um, you know, one of the lingering ghosts here is Durkheim and his understanding of holiness uh, and the profane and the mundane as a sort of um, hallmark of all religious thought. But on the other hand, in my field, the other lingering ghost is that of Martin Buber, who famously says that Judaism distinguishes between the hallowed and the not yet hallowed, between the sacred and the not yet sacred. And in that right. sense, like in many other things, he was actually a very astute leader of Hasidic sources, because within the world of Hasidut, you find a a phrase that comes time and time again of harchavat gvulot hakodesh, the expansion right. of the boundaries of holiness, such that Shabbat becomes indicative of a kind of holiness that reaches its apex on the seventh day of the week, but inheres in all days, right? Like Hasidic right. sources that you could um, find by the dozen talk about the Shabbat during the week, or sacred right. space, right. or sacred time right, or right. sacred people, or sacred speech. Um, it exists in a kind of continuum of intensity. And one good example of this is the Spadamet, who quotes this um, well-known rabbinic passage um, that um, everything that is included in a general right. principle and then is specified um, comes to teach us something about the general principle, right? And so he says this applies to holy matters as well. So the Sabbath is there to teach you about the sanctity of all days. Um, Jerusalem is there to teach you about the sanctity of all places. Am Yisrael are there to teach you about the sanctity of all people. Right. And it sort of stretches in all of these interesting directions. And I wonder if there, there isn't this interesting kind of return to um, one of my favorite sort of texts on the issue of holiness in the rabbinic canon is um, the Mishnah and Sota about Lashon HaKodesh, about the holy language. And I always ask my students, so what's the opposite of the holy language? And, um, and the Mishnah there says every other language, Kolashon, as opposed to 
Lashon Chol, or something like that, which appears in some of the manuscripts, but it's obviously a later interpolation. And so there you have this designation as something holy, but it's not predicated on this kind of um, um, dyadic notion of the world is defined by one or the other. And then in Hasidut, and especially in the way that it was, you know, interpreted but in the early periods, but not only, which then gets lifted up by someone like Rav Cook and that famous formulation of uh, um, a yeshan yitkadesh vea, um, how does it go? Vea chadash yitkadesh, right? right? That which is old shall be renewed and that which is new shall become sanctified. Right, right. Well, these are such, such uh, deep questions. So let me, let me try to, uh, to make sense of it. And clearly, maybe there is another complete different resonance of, of, uh, of the concept of, of Kdusha in this, this tradition. But I think it can, it can, there is some way in which it can be captured. So what is it to sanctify something for human acts? Uh, and, uh, and then, and then the extension of it in terms of avodah begashmiut, you know, in terms of worship, every every act can be an act of worship. So, well, one thing is to sanctify something is to move it to the domain of the sacred. I say I, I sanctify Tani Mekadesh, and that immediately, immediately, the meaning of it is now you are you are constrained by uh, by capacity of use by capacity of manipulation, et cetera, et cetera. But then when we move to the broader, broader wonderful texts that you brought from the Hasidic tradition, I would say the insight there is the following. And this is the, maybe, a, maybe I'm capturing something. Is whatever, whatever human endeavor that we have, let's say a complete instrumental exchange. If it endures, it rests on a kind of a transcendent base, right? Which you have to recognize as the, as the, as the thing that maintains it, right? Uh, um, so, so you would say, well, even the most carnal of, of, of lust, right? Even the most lustful thought uh, rests, on, rests on, a, on, a, on a principle of quest, which is higher than it is. And when you can find it, right, you can, you can lift it. Right, you can lift it when you understand that kernel in it. Right, um, so it's not it's not by way of flattening the transcendence, but it's by way of extending it to be manifest as something that ensures the being of everything when you approach it properly with the proper intention and approach and disposition. And that's, I think, uh, that's, that's the genius of Hasidut uh, was that, that insight, right? Clearly it rests on a certain semi-pantheistic conception of, God presence in everything that gives it its life and existence, but it's 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 larger than just a certain idea of a certain notion of semi-pantheistic metaphysics. It's actually a certain you know every human endeavor, if it endures, if it has value, uh, etc., rests on something beyond it. And if you uncover that beyond, you kind of sanctify it, right? So, um, so, um, um, in, in the case of rabbinic, in the case of, of the, and hence the, the counter, the counter ascetic response, right? Say, well, if you have lustful thoughts, rather than repress them, you can raise them to a higher, 
higher source when you know that they they have their sustenance in something bigger, right? And 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 that's uh, one aspect of the great soul of Rav Kook, who um, who would always his his kind of religious sensibility was all about that, right? That that within the larger scheme, if we want to say. That particular thing you will realize that has sustained itself from its connection to a higher mode, which you, which the, which the, which the, which the pious, the, the real piety of Hasidut is really understanding that. So that might be a way of, of bridging or extending or clearly, by, by the way, one, one interesting thing, the, the, one of the resistance of Mitnagdim to Hasidut had to do with, with whether you can maintain a sense of Kedusha without a sense of Chol, right? Do we have a concept of Shabbat without a concept of, of the profane? And that's a, that's a, deep, uh, that's a deep question. So uh, yes, so let, let, me, let me just stop here, but clearly that opens the whole venue of, of the development of the concept within major trends in Jewish thought, yeah. Moshe, uh, thank you for, for that, and thank you for the talk, of course, and uh, I'd like to, you know, as someone who is a staunchly and kind of narrowly modernist, yeah, I would like to, to ask you the following, you know, listening to you last time we spoke, and today even more so, I was struck by the possibility that what you're describing with your notion of the non-instrumental is perhaps a, a, a different take, an alternative uh, history to the history offered by, for example, someone like Max Weber when he talks about disenchantment. So I'm curious as to your view, you know, to what extent uh, the malaise we are feeling as so-called moderns, especially those of us who are not religiously committed, who do not define themselves by religious affiliation, to what extent do you think that, you know, the malaise of our age has to do with um, the fact that so much of our lives has become instrumentalized, only right. a mean for various goals? Right. And perhaps to what extent, you know, what we're seeking in modernity is to recapture or reconnect to that source, which many of us uh, have lost. So this would be, you know, one question uh, on my mind. And perhaps tying it to um, other thinkers who are, you know, reflecting not just on the modern age, but also on what it means to be human. So someone like Immanuel Kant, of course, comes to mind in his ethics. To what extent do you find uh, echoes of the model you presented to us thinking about, you know, sacredness? Also, in, in the line of thought, you know, starting with Kant, going all the way to modernity, and of course, you know, crisscrossing between those thinkers who come from a Christian background like Kant, to even right. Jewish thinkers who either follow in his footsteps, you know, Hermann Cohen would be one, right. Right. or others uh, who come from a different, you know, tradition, more from phenomenological tradition, someone like Levinas, for example, and his ethics. So do you see connections between, you know, your approach and the model you're offering right. and these thinkers? Right. So this again, what I that's opening a whole vista of of, uh, of, of realm of thinking. So a um, few things. First of all, uh, Kant really um, the whole idea of of human dignity. By the way, Kant uses the term sacred a few times, and he, he speaks about what is sacred in us. Uh, in terms of our capacity for non-instrumental uh, reasoning uh, that follows the moral imperative. Uh, so, so that's the holy in us. By the way, that's the reason why we are deserving dignity. Uh, what, that's the source of human dignity, right? Which Because we are capable of doing the right because it's right, not because it serves us in any ways 
So there is a way of transcending ourselves. Uh, and, and it's not an accident, I think still, it's not an accident, accident the draw that Kant had on so many of the Jewish thinkers, though Kant had very ambiguous relationship to Judaism, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, as a thinker with the prejudices that come from from the background. But still, I mean, and and Hermann Cohen, uh, uh, both as well as critique uh, and and an acceptance of Kant is related to, I think, these roots, where where the sacred is not about religious experience of the numinous per se. It attaches to a whole field of human relationships and, and actions in the world. Um, and that's, that's a deep affinity. Now, uh, you, you have pointed, and, and this is, uh, what, is what is the uh, disenchantment, right? And, and, and this uh, and disenchantment, uh, Weber had it in a particular way, and he thought, by the way, monotheism is already uh, one step towards disenchantment, etc. And uh, and here again, I, I mean, the the in some ways it's a, it's Christian understanding. Christian is such a large term, but it's a kind of city of God thing. You know, it's a dualistic thing. Uh, uh, I, I mean, you can, given that the sacred is manifested in time, space, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you cannot call it disenchantment, though, though um, it's non-pagan in any ways. But that's a. I, I want to say something about the field of the malaise of 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 the instrumental, and here I come. I think that the most powerful. And that's where the sacred had such resonance in, in thinking far beyond the religious, strictly religious domain, because the main force of instrumentalization is the market, right? That's where, you know, uh, where everything uh, has, has exchange value, right? It's kind of, uh, and, uh, you know, and this is why the the I, I'm interested in the moments in which uh, you ask yourself: Is there something sacred here? Right? Is there something sacred to you? And one thing is that you're not going to buy and sell it. Right? It's it's kind of uh, uh, so uh, so so I'm, I'm serious about advertisements. I so, said, so, well, I I think that. That uh, that inauguration of a president, with all the the abuse that this role has been taken, is not going to be interrupted by an advertisement, right? Though the the temptation is huge because you know it's it has well that's sacred. That's that's for us. It's it's a it's a and then you ask yourself. For us as teachers, I right, say let's let's say that that I don't know a big company, Coca-Cola, will come to Stanford or others say we'll give you a big contribution, but from time to time during the class, the way I do it now, mention Coca-Cola somewhere. Say so, no, no, you you desecrating, you desecrating the act of teaching, right? I mean, I mean there is a desecration here. You cannot use it for profit. It's not. So what is it, the thing that cannot be bought or sold? By the way, for Kant, that was part of the definition of, of, uh, of human dignity, right? Which is, which is not exchangeable. It's not replaceable, exchangeable, etc. And I think, uh, I, I think one thing that, that, uh, that, the problem of the ecological sensibility, right? And the ecological crisis comes with that ethos of saying, maybe we, we have to re reconfigure our relationship to the world as, a, as not as, a, as an instrument and say, well, let's restore the idea of Shabbat. I mean, in a, in, in a way, 
So, um, so I would say, um, for me, a mark of a power, powerful concept within a certain domain that it attaches itself to such deep human quests and then it will have echoes outside of it. And I think our conversation leads to that, right? And, and I think in, 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 in the modern quest is, is, the, is the, the control of the markets, uh, how far the realm of the market uh, 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 distorts human values, human sense of transcendence, uh, it distorts love, uh, and other things, the options that it opens. So I think I think it's there as a as a category. And I would say part of uh, when I read, uh, by the way, do kind in that respect it's closer than if you ask yourself. We take Eliade's conception of the of of the sacred. They say, well, it doesn't it doesn't go much beyond itself or auto. Okay, we have the numinos, we have, you know, dread, etc. And and by the way, that was all of Otto's effort. You know, he says there is a religious non-reductive realm that has to be preserved, and it's the numinos. Uh, and I think it's it's a bad service to religion in some ways. You know, in the in the Hasidic manner, actually. No, no, no. We want to extend the concept of the sacred. We don't want to. We don't want to uh, exclusively mark it as a, as a non-reductive, et cetera, et cetera. So that's part of our conversation. Wonderful. Thank you for that, Moshe. And uh, I'd like, since the time is kind of running away from us, I'd like, you know, on that note, to already draw on one of the questions from our silent invisible participant so one of the students you know raised the question um, of art uh, and the question is the following i would be curious to hear professor halberter speak of the possibility of art or aesthetic experience to allow for the sacred within the secular right and i think there's an interesting connection also to what you said about the market because as we all know you know, art and the marketplace are not, you know, separated from each other. So if you have some thoughts about, about that as well. Right. Yeah, the, what, what I, first of all, I, I apologize for, for answering too long and then, and then uh, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe not allowing enough questions and I'm really sorry. So uh, I, I want to say one thing, art, art is a very interesting domain, right? And here we come to Kant's concept of the sublime as a, as a, as a, as a kind of an analogy. Uh, and we, we look for the, uh, I think part of our uh, quest for the artistic aesthetic experience is that experience that we somehow transcend the realm of the instrumental. I, I think, I, I am, I am ambivalent. My point of ambivalence about the way in which art substitutes for the sacred is that art, again, I'm very careful with it. Art doesn't make a claim on us, right? And therefore, it's rarely established as a moral community. Um, and, uh, and and that's a that's that's a complex thing. How far art go? Now here again, what is art? What is art? What's the calling of art? And we we know, uh, and we know the contemporary trend of art as a as a, as a social as a social expression. Uh, is the aesthetic realm separate realm or not? Uh, I would say the following, if the non-instrumental nature of the aesthetic experience gets integrated into a calling, into a claim, 
into something that will not only, only experience differently, but will act differently out of that encounter in the world. Then I would say, amen, we have reached, we have reached the realm of, because Jewishly speaking, here again, it's such a large category, the transcendence will always have to be attached with the notion of a mitzvah, right? Of the of the of the obligation and a deed, right? You know, the the obligation to act in a particular way, uh, and does art uh, does art just as an elevating form of a certain experience, or does it claim us? And in what way? I mean, this is a real struggle within artistic expression and and what and the self understanding of art is a creative mode, clearly. And that touches upon this wonderful question. Maybe as a quick follow-up, Moshe, because I think this is a real fascinating area. Um, you know, a thinker, you know, some at least attached to some extent to Jewish tradition, namely Theodor Adorno speaks about the ways in which certain types of art Mm -hmm. Those types of arts that are retreated, fully retreated as much as possible from the marketplace, uh, mm -hmm. can give us a sense of the non-instrumental. Right. So maybe there is a distinction, you know, within art between right. you know those art forms and expressions in which there is some market potential to them, and this mm -hmm. ideal, very lofty notion of art as completely divorced from it, where we can experience that realm you're relating to or talking right. about. Right. Yeah. A, another question from the chat is regarding language. A, and this is the question. My question is regarding language. If one distinction between Kodesh and Chol lies in instrumentality, does that apply to language as well? Isn't all language instrumental by definition? Right. That's a great question. So I'm, ask, I'm by the way, asking at what point is language defiled, abused, right? At what point you say, wow, language was abused here completely, What's, was, let's say, desecrated. And I think, I think clearly it's always a tool, an expressive tool, etc. But we do have moments in which we say, hmm, here's a desecration, a kind of a linguistic desecration, right? As, especially in, in using a particular term that has resonance in a particular set and, and has evocative power and shifting it and abusing it to a different realm, right? We, we experience that. Where, 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 where words stop, stop carry their meaning in ways, you know, they, they can be manipulated, shifted, played with. Uh, uh, we, we, we uh, uh, I mean, political rhetoric, or not only political rhetoric, the rhetoric of hate and et cetera, et cetera is full of, desecration of language. And it will be interesting to uh, capture those moments where you say, no, 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 no. I mean, by the way, I, I wanna say sometimes, uh, there are a few verses that were so abused for purposes at least that I feel so humanly wrong that by now are very hard to even utter them. You know, they say, well, these, these verses or these words were already defied. Uh, and let's, uh, and we have our, in our lexicon, you, you know, if, if you take a, 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 let's say a bunch of racists who appropriate the language of rights in a very, perverse way, and we see it in different ways. 
you would say, no, no, okay, okay. Here's a precious moral category that was desecrated here. Uh, and uh, we do uh, we do have uh, in that respect there is instrumentalization of of language uh, and I think one major feature of deterioration of a culture is when the language is desecrated where language is desecrated and that's where, uh, 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 that's where, where, where we, we, we experience that. And I think it's, it's deep in our linguistic experience. You know, as, as someone who studied modern German history and culture, I completely relate to what you just said. Right. I see that one of the students uh, has a question. I hope technology works. Uh, Ellie, uh, Ali Hazel, do you want to raise your question because I see your hand up? Let's see if we can if we can hear Ali. Um, no, I see the hand is now down. So maybe it was a. Oh, oh I, I Ali, please go ahead. Yeah, now she's in. Ali. Yes, I, I hope you all can hear me. First, I'd just like to thank um, Professor Halbertel for joining us. I, it was an accidental hand raise, but it gives me an opportunity to thank you for uh, the response to my first question, which I will continue to ponder. So thanks very much. So Ellie was the one to ask about art, Gosh. so you just know. Uh, there's another question uh, in the chat from a future student. So this is a place to say that uh, a Hebrew University student, Ariel Horowitz, is joining our program in comparative literature and the Tauvi Center next year. And he's asking in the Q&A, what is the relation between the sacred and the magic? Looking, for instance, at uh, the magic forces which Kabbalahs, uh, Kabbalists uh, regarded sacred objects, such as tefillin, or nowadays it emulates our religious charms, which one wishes to acquire and thus own a sacred object. Right. Well, right, here again, clearly my phenomenology, uh, if it would have covered all phenomenon of the sacred in Jewish tradition, there will be something wrong in my phenomenology. Uh, now, uh, the idea of potent powers, you know, that's what Ariel, I think, is, is, is pointing to, right? The, the sacred is, is, has a potent power, uh, hence its attachment to magic, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It has a power to bestow good, to... Um, and that's a, that's a tradition because, because uh, being connected somehow to divine realm, it, it has more power than other things in the world. And it's both a source of danger and blessing. Clearly there is such a, such a use that is not uh, covered by my analysis. I just wanna say one thing, by the way, here's the Maimonidean response. Uh, to mezuzah, you know, mezuzah is the ultimate, you might say, amulet, right? It preserves the house, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And Maimonides uh, relates to the uh, to um, uh, to those who relate to mezuzah as a, as a charm, as a magical uh, uh, thing. He says, lo dai lo uh, uh, because they write sacred names there, etc., etc. Right? That they turned mezuzah, uh, which is about love of God, which is you know written in the mezuzah, the love of God, etc., etc., as if it is an amulet for their own benefit which is for him a desecration of the object. So, uh, and I, I wanna say one thing, one interesting thing, because though he doesn't cover it, it will be interesting to follow 
uh, improper uses of divine names and different ritual objects as a way of act of Hilul, even with that tradition, right? Um, um, that that would be a, a way into uh, into a, a framework that has a different conception of the sacred and, and rightfully so. Great, thank you, Moshe. I'm going to bring another question from the chat, namely from our dear colleague, Professor Vera Chentov. And she's asking, uh, what are the connections between one, beauty and the sacred, sacred as an expression of a uh, sacred as an expression of the sacred sacred as beautiful and then two sacred and truth so these two aspects right uh, wow uh, um yeah i think i think i think be, i mean beauty i mean here we can go kant's way sublime the, the idea of the sublime uh, um, realizing the beauty of thing, our capacity to realize the beauty of thing when we don't perceive it as an instrument. Um, here, by the way, um, the relationship between love, sacred and truth possible, which is that our capacity to know the world or things is when we don't relate to them as things for our use. Right. Um, so, in some ways, uh, how do children, how do, I mean, parents and children, this is a complex relationship of instrumentalization. And you always worry about, as a parent, you always worry, am I just a credit card here, you know, and, uh, and which is fine in certain ways. And, and you know, well, when does the child, uh, love the parent, I mean, in the sense of transcends this instrumental relationship when he knows the parent, meaning he or she uh, know the parent, uh, because, uh, because knowing the parent means knowing that the parent doesn't serve only as an instrument. Your mother, your father has, has a world of their own. So uh, our, our capacity to gain truth in the deep sense has to do with our capacity to detach from the grip of instrumentalization. Um, uh, and that's that's maybe something here, right? And, and by the way, I, I, I wanna say something about politics, uh, by the way, truth and instrumentalization the attack on science that you see in politics today, as if there is not such a thing as an independent fact, everything is political, right? Climate change, wh whatever you talk about. There, there, the, the, we have two instrumentalizing forces, the markets and politics. Uh, and, and now if, uh, if everything is political, meaning there is no such a thing as truth of the matter because everything is just a vehicle for political identity and ideology, then we don't have this a very simple sense of a realm of truth, which we can share. Truth about the world, truth about, and, and the moment it is all consumed by power struggle, uh, that's, you know, where uh, where our world becomes hollow. It both lacks truth and we might say even beauty. Maybe that's a way of, of approaching the question. Maybe to follow up on that, Moshe, um, and to a certain extent, going back to Ariel's question, uh, what do we do in cases where there are contested views of sacredness, even within the same tradition? So I'm thinking, for example, you know, some uh, you know religious or observant Jews think of the Western Wall as sacred all the way to the last stone, whereas for others, I'm thinking about you know Yeshayahu Leibovitch, for example, the whole notion of the Western Wall and sacredness is not as simple as that. 
Um, so what do you do in a situation in which there are contested views of one and the same object, person, circumstance, sure. etc.? Sure. sure. So I'm, I'm, you know, though I, I have immense regard for labor, which I, 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 I can I can see the idea of the Western wall, Kotel Amaravi is a sacred space. And uh, but I would I would be interesting when is it violated? The when is it desecrated, right? So um, uh, when it is abused. I, I, by the way, I have a big attraction to the Western wall. I think the idea of a of a wall of a rune as a as the as the representation of sacred, there is something to it, right? I mean, there is something very deep in that. This wall of a of a ruined home. Um, I I wouldn't dismiss it as a as a very rich and profound religious category, though it attaches itself to a place, etc. But uh, apropos. Uh, apropos uh, the clash, uh, I think I think the danger around the Temple Mount, Haram el Sharif, is really the attachment of the concept of sacredness to the concept of self sovereignty, and that's where that's where uh, the sacredness is violated, right? Um, that's that's where that's where the, the that clash will come in. Now, uh, in in places, unfortunately, in, and this is clearly in the history of religious traditions, where traditions attach themselves, new religions attach themselves to the sacred domains of the prior religion. Uh, and then coexisting with one another in what I would call the overlapping maps of the sacred, that will be then a whole a whole challenge. So it's conflicting concepts of the sacred, and it's also conflicting maps of the sacred from different religious spheres. And how do we, in the name of the sacred, transcend that? That's that's a, that's such a deep challenge, and and uh, you know uh, when when Israel when in Six Day War when Israel conquered the Harabite, they used to say Harabite beyadeno, right? The Temple Mount uh, is in our hands, but I think anachnu beyadaim shel Harabite, right? Uh, we are at the hands of of Temple Mount. I mean, it's such a, uh, that's where I would see the clash, possible potent and dangerous clash. Thank you for that, Moshe. And since another challenge we have is the challenge of time, I'm going to right. give Charlotte and Ariel still for a moment uh, the stage um, and see if they want to add something before we conclude. Charlotte. Uh, no, I just, uh, I want to uh, thank you, Moisha. Um, this is really wonderful. Um, also the opportunity to have this as a seminar and the discussion. So um, uh, I really love this. I mean, I, I, I um, and I, I still have a lingering question, the larger question, which I don't want to end with, but I'm going to put it out there anyhow, which is, uh, you partially answered that in, in, in your last comment, which is whether we really need the, the, the concept of the holy still in the modern, right? Whether we need it, what is the, we assume, I mean, obviously, as, a, as an observant person, it's part of our cultural vocabulary on the Jewish side, but in political terms and all these other terms, do we, right? And the question to me extends, for instance, to the ecological crisis in terms of, uh, for the, in order to address this, 
right? It, 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 it's a real question. Do we need for that a relationship to the world that's redefined along the notion of the sacred or, right? would it not be better in those contexts to actually just go all out by an instrumental, by an instru by a different kind of instrumental uh, um, right. Right? Right. of nurturing, managing, of preserving the world, but all those uh, uh, instrumental kind of uh, terminology. But I mean, I'm not advocating this. It's, in, in, it's a general right. question in the end. Right. But, yeah. That's a powerful question, and then we, the question we have to ask ourselves is, what we, what is we gonna lose if we didn't have the concept of the sacred? Right. right. Mm -hmm. In what way our world, as humans, will be diminished? Right. Without right. that concept, right? That's the question. Right. And then we ask ourselves, well. It's such a basic category. It's, a, it's such a profound category. Uh, how do we understand it? Uh, how do we understand the, the category? And what will be lost in a world when that, there is nothing, nothing sacred, if we want to put it this way, nothing sacred. Well, we have to understand what do we mean there is nothing sacred. Uh, yes, that's a, that's, that's a powerful question. Um, um, a world without a bat, I mean, in a, in a very broad sense. Uh, yes, that's the, the very powerful opening of a, of a whole new question. Thank you, Moish. So wonderful. I hand it to uh, Ariel. <laughs> Yeah, echoing Charlotte and Amir's thanks. This was just wonderful. Um, you know, I'm very much walking away from this with um, these considerations of concepts that are powerful. And one of the ways that one judges that is that whether or not it has a deep afterlife and the sort of echoes of a concept and its continued both relevance and centrality um, reflect something about the, uh, the, the potency of that category of experience. I was very taken by your understanding of, uh, of Hasidic under, uh, expansions of the holy as thinking about human activities as resting on a kind of transcendent base. And we might say a transcendent base that's imminent in its formation and it is the presence of those individuals or that action or whatever it might be and what they are doing that then transforms that into a revelatory encounter right. in which the depth is no longer an abyss, but it's the depth of the overflow um, of, uh, of a kind of meaning that, that's there. As someone who is engaged a lot with questions of environmental ethics these days, and in particular with the ways that religions, Judaism included, offer a powerful rebuke to carbon capitalism and to the instrumental reason that undergirds both our economic structures and our philosophical epistemologies, um, I found your remarks about the way in which conceptions of holiness can, as you put it, rescue us from the grip of instrumentalism to be a very powerful thing to walk away from this with. So Moshe, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much for the questions and the discussion and the invitation really, it was really wonderful. It's, it's all of us who thank you, Moshe, including all these many participants who need to be silenced for the sake of the webinar. I'm sure all of them also uh, are incredibly grateful. This has been a, a wonderful seminar. And I think we all share the hope that, you know, soon we can host you here, you know, with us to continue the conversation. Because as we noticed, there's so much more to be said and to ask and discuss. So on this hopeful note, um, with wishes for good health, um, and um, all the best to you uh, in Jerusalem. Uh, we conclude at this point. Thanks. Thank you. Thank very you very much. much. Thanks. I'll stop the recording. <laughs>